What can we learn about Moses' leadership in the last third of his life as he leads the people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land? That's what we're going to talk about today. Every mother is like Moses. She does not enter the Promised Land. She prepares a world she does not see. Pope Paul VI. Wow, that's kind of deep. I'm going to have to think about that one. Hello, everyone. This is just going to be a quick note about some changes coming to this podcast and the Start with Small Steps podcast. I'm going to move the Start with Small Steps podcast to Tuesday, which Small Steps with God is on Tuesday, but I'm going to alternate them every other week. So we will have one week with Start with Small Steps, and then we'll have one week of Small Steps with God, and then it'll just keep repeating that pattern. If you have anything to say about it, you're welcome to email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd like to hear your opinion of this, but I'm hoping too that having it be every other week will give you more time to sort of soak it in. Maybe you decide that you want to read this book. The other thing is that the other podcasts, Start With Small Steps, is very much like this one. Essentially the same format. I read a book, I discuss a book or a concept. And in that case, it is about productivity, making your life better, tips and tricks to get your goals. This one obviously is focused on the Bible and our walk with God, but I think they go together quite well. So again, both podcasts are going to be on every other Tuesday. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book from the Great Live series, Moses, A Man of Selfless Dedication by Charles Swindoll. We've talked about how Moses came to the place where he could lead the people out of Egypt. This book talks about what it takes in order to meet God. (laughs) I thought this was great in kind of a reflection of where we came from Moses. First, he says that we have to be willing to obey God. When you talk to God, when you ask God for things, when you prepare to do the work of God, are you willing to obey? Are you willing to do the thing that he has to say? What if we don't like what he has to say? Hmm. Those people in Egypt didn't want to leave. They did, but they didn't. The Pharaoh didn't want those people to leave. Moses didn't want to go there. But you know what? The thing that makes Moses great is he was willing to obey God. Then it says, be sensitive to listen. You're going to pay attention to what God says, not just hear what you want us hear. I think that's what happens a lot of times when we ask God a honest question. We still don't hear what God says. We hear Our own voice is coming back to us. We're just listening to ourselves in a different way. Three, consecrate your heart, which means cleaning yourselves. In this case, God told him to take off his sandals. And there was this outward purification because this land that Moses was standing on was holy. But then he also told Moses to go down to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Wash the garments, be prepared for the third day, The Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. And it says no foreigner should eat of it, but anyone who is a slave was brought out may eat of it if they're circumcised. When you become circumcised, that was the step of the covenant at that time. That was a sign that you were joining the people of Israel. So now that person was part of the congregation, part of the group. And now that worker is going to be a part of the family. You see that this faith in God is always meant for everybody who will sign on to that covenant, who will agree with God and do this step. It says, if a stranger travels with you and would keep the Passover, let the males be circumcised, and he shall be as native of the land. He's going to be a part of this. Everyone who becomes circumcised is going to be a part of this. There were many institutions then of the Passover meal and what was going to be done. It is something that we have seen at the time of Jesus. It's something that we see even to this day, the, this path. When they left the land, it said that God didn't take them by the Philistines. Where I was in Israel and Ashkelon, that was the Philistine land. He said that he doesn't want people to change their mind when they see war. So he was not prepared to give them war very early on. God led the people out of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And that's where we did a whole podcast about the Red Sea and the meaning behind that. But he took the bones of Joseph with him to bring him back to Israel, to the land. And it says that they moved on from Sukkoth, which is the town, 
And it talks about where they were, that God was a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night to give them light. The other thing that fire will do, and I know this as a camper, is keep animals away. If you're afraid of critters coming too close to your camp, having a fire at night around will keep you safe from the animals as well. God is leading them. We know that we got to the point where they hit the Red Sea. We talked about this in episode 13 and 14 of this podcast with the book, The Red Sea Rules. We went into a lot of detail about it. We're not going to talk about it so much right now. But essentially, that leadership that Moses took was important because he was up against a wall. What do you do when you're up against a wall? You have nowhere to go. Boy, I've been in places of leadership where we've been up against the wall. I was part of a tech startup company and something happened. And I watched what a real leader does when a company is up against the wall. And and I have to say, I'm a better human being for watching that. As Moses leads people away and the Egyptians are taken care of, they start grumbling. They start complaining. And they'll say, what do you do taking us out here? Are you going to do to us what you did to Egypt? We had things to do. We had food to eat. We had water to drink. And are you just going to lead us out into the desert to die? And Moses kept encouraging them. I love this. This was in Exodus 14, 13. Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you only have to be silent. God said to Moses, these people are crying to you. Tell the people to keep going forward. Lift up your staff and stretch it over the sea. Then after they were saved, they sang song of praise to God. They led them away and came out to this place where there was no water. It was called Mara. If we know anything about Hebrew, Mara means bitterness. People were bitter because there was nothing to drink. Why only have anything to drink? But then God provided water for them and water and made it sweet. This became the 12 springs of water and the 70 palms. They camped by there. It's called Bayalim. And then people grumbled again. There's no food. We have nothing to eat. And God says, I'm going to make it rain bread from heaven for you. Food is going to come down to feed people. He is providing. We saw it too. You know, when Jesus made enough bread and fishes to feed thousands of people, God does provide. And in this case, he made it rain. And the idea was it was going to have bread from heaven. It's called manna. I always laugh because manna means what, what is it? Which I just love. I think it's so funny because they all gathered it. They all ate it, but they're like, well, I don't know what that is. Of course, the complaining came back as well. There's so much water in the Nile River and you took us away from there. And now we have no water. And of course, God kept providing. And God would be angry with the people and Moses would rebuke the people. He would tell them. But essentially, he gave them this message of constantly hearing the grumbles, but still providing, even though that they were being uh, depressing, I guess. It's just depressing. And it's the same thing we saw, you know, at the time of Jesus. We were a real whiny bunch when we're (laughs) not happy with things. And of course, this is going to be, I think, uh, hard on Moses and Aaron and Miriam too. All these miraculous things happen. I mean, imagine you being this people. You saw Pharaoh release you just like Moses said he was going to do. You saw these plagues that God provided for your release. You saw that not only did the Egyptians let you go, but gave you all this stuff, just like God said he would. He saved you from the Red Sea. All these things, step after step after step was happening. And yet people get grumbly. People get angry. People get crabby about everything. And it's up to the leadership to keep going, to keep people's spirits up to provide for their needs. This is continuously grumbling and complaining about things. But we meet our first people, the Amalek, came and fought against Israel. And Joshua was the person to lead this war. And when Moses held up his hand, they would prevail. This is a training. Any nation you're going to be a part of, there's going to be war. The 400 years that they were in Egypt, they probably never saw war because it was the Egyptians fighting the war for them. The Egyptians went out quite a few wars and sacked quite a few nations and had many battles. 
probably the people of Israel were just slaves making bricks. They never had to face it. The people who were living in this land were probably told by God that this was going to happen. We know that when God was telling the Israelites, you know, Babylon's going to come in and sack you and remove, and remove you from this land, it was a warning. There was a warning there. So I imagine they got a warning as well. We eventually get to the place where there's Jethro, which is Moses' father-in-law. They get to Midian, so they're visiting. It was nice that he was able to see his father-in-law again, probably see someplace he knew. That's probably very heartening for him. Even leaders need to feel heartened at times. And so Moses listened to the advice of his father-in-law. Then he was able to create sub-chiefs over the people of Israel to make it easier to manage the people. So to grow in leadership, like Moses grew in leadership, sometimes you need advice from someone either older than you, has more experience than you, or someone who just has a great idea. I never got any indication, or did we see, Jethro had teams of people. But he brought Moses on, and he came up with a leadership idea that made managing the entire tribes of Israel better. Good job. And so Israel then goes to Mount Sinai. Moses went up to God, it said. God was calling him out from the mountain. You shall say to your house of Jacob, tell the people of Israel, you yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. I wonder if that's like another Lord of the Rings thing, right? The hobbits came out on the wings of eagles. If you will indeed obey my word and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possessions among all people. All the earth is mine, and you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you should speak to the people of Israel. This is a very special message. This is the covenant with the people of Israel. And one lesson we always learn about leadership is that up and down communication. Moses talking to God, God talking to Moses, Moses talking to the people. Communication is the key. One thing about leadership is that people don't tend to follow the rules unless there are rules. It'd be nice if we just treated each other kindly, if we just treated each other fairly. Oh, did I break your fence? Let me pay for your fence. But we don't do that. We're harsh with each other and good to ourselves. And so we don't always treat each other well. That's why so many rules were given to Moses so that they were given to the people of how to treat each other. Moses was writing it down. You can see it. If we go to a football game and we're all watching a football game, we will start a chant. We will start a cheer. If there were no cheers, we would start inventing them. People need something for that cohesion. And this is how God is binding his people together with this structure, this law, this method that they're supposed to live in and all the different altars and Parts of their civil government. God took them out into the wilderness to train them to be a people, to be united together, to work together, to have a priest class that they supported together, and to most importantly worship God. These are going to be the incense, the oils, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. This is going to be the structure of our temple system so that we can stay together as a people worshiping God. And you might question it. Well, why do you need all this stuff? Why do we need everything that we see in Exodus? It's it's practically 12 different chapters of what God is telling them to do. But you know what? How many centuries that this all held together where people followed this and kept together as a people. So while Moses is up here on Mount Sinai, finally there are two tablets that are etched with the finger of God. Comes down and sees the people are making a golden calf. And who was the head of it? It was Aaron. And Aaron has excuses. We'll talk about this in deep detail at some point. Oh, well, this was for the feast of the Lord. They were turning away to idols. And where did they get it? They they probably saw it their entire time in Egypt. But, oh, goodness, the people are disappointing again. First, they grumble, they complain, they worry. Now they complained against Moses and they complained against God. And now this, the ultimate betrayal of an of a idol. You have the living God who brought you across the Red Sea, brought you out of Egypt, 
giving you your own land, has been with you day and night. And this is what you do. I mean, oh gosh, you know, it's just a, it's just a horrible thing. So Moses intervenes. He prays to God that they would have mercy on them. And God says, I, you have found favor in my sight. I know you by name. Isn't that amazing? We want to know that God knows us by name. So we get two new tablets and now the covenant is renewed. Again, the covenant's an agreement and the deal is made. Moses comes off of the mountain and it says his face was shining. So you could see throughout this entire time, all the years that people were spending, this trip was not that long. It would not have taken this long to do this whole trip. This was something I never understood when I was Jewish. Why did this trip take so long? Why was God, I thought, punishing them when he's the one who brought them out into the desert? He wasn't punishing them. He was training them. But what God was doing was he was making the people into a people group with rules, laws, worship methods, tabernacles, oil stands, the Ark of the Covenant, incense, all these types of things, rituals for worship, Sabbath sacrifices, all the things that we're supposed to do. But the reminding, God is always with you. We're bringing this to the place that's going to become our home. The various offerings were set up. And so when you think, uh, if you're listening to the Bible in small steps, where Jesus is talking about the law, the law and the prophets, this piece where God is giving Moses the law, the rules, the things that they should be doing, that's where this is all handed out. This is making a nation out of a people that were slaves for 400 years. You can imagine that when you've been slaves in a land like this, you had no leadership skills. You had no real people identification, except we saw that people believed in God, but there was no nation there, right? You have no identity. You are the slaves of Egypt. God is bringing them out and turning them into this people group and giving them a priest class turning Aaron's and his family into what Aaron was, who had turned against Moses at certain points, said bad things against Moses, created the golden calf, and then kind of lied about it. He is turning them into the priest class so that we could have this group to help the people follow the laws of God and understand their relationship with God. And you will see as you get to like Leviticus 19, which like I said, we're not going through it, you will see things that Jesus said that you don't hate your brother in your heart. You don't take vengeance. You don't bear a grudge against people. You don't do injustices in court. Keep, your, keep the statutes. When Moses destroys the tablets, he angers against his people. Chuck Swindoll said that there is five levels of anger, mild irritation, indignation, which is a deeper level, wrath, and then comes um, fury where you can't control yourself, and the next one's rage. Moses had an anger problem his whole life. He murdered the Egyptian. He spent 40 years, it says, cooling his heel and learning in self-discovery. But he also broke the tablets in his very own hand, the thing that was written by God's hand, because his anger couldn't be contained. We know that God always forgave, too. He always forgave him instructed him, taught him, tried to educate him on how to be a leader, how to be someone that forgives, because you know what? God forgives too. God was patient with Moses. God turned him into someone who could create a nation of Israel. Moses has to be replaced. There has to be a leader who's going to be named that's going to be next. And in Numbers 14, that leadership is going to be handed to Caleb and to Joshua because they were the ones that were steadfast. They always were true and they were actual leaders. Joshua, we see, were the people who led the military campaigns. He led the missions to go into town. He always stood up when something had to happen. And it said in Numbers eleven twenty eight, it said that Joshua was always the attendant of Moses from his youth. He was there with him from the very beginning, spent his entire life training under Moses, learning from Moses to be that leader. 
But in summary of this whole book and why I was talking about Moses as a leader, we have seen Moses going to the guy of, send anyone else, don't send me, send any human being other than me, to someone who spoke to Pharaoh, brought his people out, dealt with frustration, even thoughts of, just kill me. These people are not listening to me, to turning into the leader who gave law to the whole people, who gave God's word to everyone so, again, they could be a great nation, and raised up the next generation in Joshua. Since Joshua was with Moses from the very beginning, Joshua became a leader and became the kind of leader that Israel needed next. God was molding Moses. God was molding the people of Israel to be a people. God was also raising up that next generation, the generation that didn't grow up in slavery their whole lives, who were born either just after getting on the road or while being out in the desert for 40 years and grown into people, free people, ones who could make themselves into the nation. But the very last part of it, why did you bring us out here? We were going to die without water tells him to strike the rock with his staff and that water will come out of it. Moses struck the rock twice. Meaning the first time he struck it, water didn't come out immediately and hit it again, hoping that it would come out the second time. It's a sign of disbelief. And so this is where God tells Moses, love you, dude, but I'm not going to let you go into the land of Israel. I'm going to Bring in people, this next generation into Israel, but the people who rebelled against me, who complained against me, who didn't trust me, they're not coming in. But this new people, this people who I forged in the desert, they're the ones who are going to be that next nation. But what God did give Moses, he brought him to the top and let him go and see from Mount Nebo, this land. That was promised him for all this time. It's a mountain that's about 4,500 feet tall and could see out a long distance. He could see this land of milk and honey that was going to be given to his people. When Jesus was at the transfiguration, he brought Moses and Elijah with him. Moses being the lawgiver, the leader of the people. Jesus is going to be the next exodus. And in this case, it's going to be the exodus away from sins, not just the exodus away from Egypt. Moses isn't dead. Moses is living and in heaven and saw all the things that he never got to see in his life and then got to see the transfiguration of Jesus with the people who still lived in that same land all those years later. We wonder about leadership and what the point of God raising us up in leadership, making us into who we are going to be. It's not just about our time on earth. It's about creating that next generation of who they're going to be. But it's also like that quote I read at the beginning, that a mother raises a child for a world she's not going to see. God raises us up in as leaders to bring on the next generation but then also to be in heaven, in the kingdom of God, as the people, the gifts, the combination of things that we were created to be in our perfection, in that new body of heaven. So the point of leadership is not just to be here on earth, but is that eternal view of leadership so that we can be in heaven, people we were always made to be without the sin, without all the garbage in our lives, but instead being the people God created us to be from the very beginning. So my challenge to you is think about the times you grumble to God. And what is it that you grumble to God about? Is it justified? Is it something that could be better asked as a question? Think about those times when you're very disgruntled and maybe how that could be more turned into an honest question instead of a grumbling. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that starting next week, Small Steps with God is going to go to every other week. 
and that it's going to stay on Tuesday. But between the every other week is going to be the podcast Start With Small Steps. They're going to alternate each other. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear your opinion of this. Start With Small Steps podcast is a little bit like this one, except it's about productivity, improving your life, helps and hints to just make your life better. This one is focused on religious books, and that one is focused more on productivity books and general living. And remember, our walk to becoming a better nation of God starts with small steps.